Hi guys! Today we're going to take a look at Adobe Illustrator and uh, since we are done with Photoshop we're going to move on again and do the next few assignments in Illustrator. Um, so we're going to do a quick introduction to Illustrator. Um, it's going to be fairly quick because a lot of uh, the important stuff and the even beginning stuff that you need to know are going to be covered in the next couple um, assignments because we're going to kind of do some easy assignments and then kind of uh, take it up a notch. Now this is the sort of welcome screen, so to speak, uh, to Illustrator where it looks very much like Photoshop and we can have a few options either to create a new one or open an existing file. Since we're going to be creating a new one, um, since we don't have a file to work from, we're going to choose create new. Now we also have little presets here, just like we had presets um, in Photoshop uh, <clears throat> to better um, orient the new uh, file to what we are going to be utilizing. So um, we'll get even more options when we cr uh, select create new and our new document window will open and again just like in Photoshop we have different presets depending on what our finished image or graphic is going to be utilized for. Um, we have print options web options as well as mobile options and you can see each of the presets is set for uh, uh, what device or what medium that the graphic is going to be utilized on. Let's switch to print and I'm just as a uh, you know look into what um, Illustrator is we're going to just choose letter for right now and let's create it. Now here too, actually just before we create, just let me go over it. So this is very similar to what we saw in um, Photoshop. Um, this is the size of what is called the artboard in um, Illustrator. And if points don't make too much sense to you, you can always go to inches. And here we're getting the eight and a half by 11 format that is associated with our letter paper size. We have orientation choices as well, uh, so on and so forth. So let's create, and then we'll get into our working window. Now this should look a lot like Photoshop, and it is. And the difference um, are going to be some of the tools, and also uh, there's going to be a lot of similarities like in the layers and things like that. So what is the real difference between Photoshop and Illustrator? Well, Photoshop is really utilized for editing and manipulating photographs. Illustrator is utilized to create um, original graphics. Um, so that's the main difference. In, when we utilize the two in um, the lens of fashion design, we're going to use Photoshop for things like mood boards, um, model shots, uh, line sheets where we create um, lists of images um, that will represent our collection. They're made for promotional, promotional materials. They're used for lookbooks and things like that. Illustrator is primarily used for um, flat sketches, um, which we'll get much more into in the next couple assignments. Um, in essence, a lot of times I'll use Photoshop and Illustrator in tandem. So if I'm creating some sort of graphic or info, um, sheet or flyer or lookbook um, or line sheet. I'm going to utilize um, Photoshop to take care of any imagery, any photograph uh, um, imagery that I might have. And then I'm going to switch to Illustrator to uh, do any of the graphics. And I tend to like to do text more in Illustrator because there's just more options uh, and more control over what text. Although Photoshop is very powerful with text as well. So um, feel free to, you know, in your um, work and whatever you're doing to utilize both of them um, and take advantage of where they each have their strengths and not to have to compromise with their weaknesses. Okay, so let's look at some of the other ways that Illustrator is very similar to Photoshop. In the same way we have the same main menu up here, or mostly the same main menu up here. Our file menu, of course, being what we typically see in file menus with our news, our opens, our saves, so on and so forth. We can also change the document setup. 
um, if we don't like um, anything that we, or we made a mistake in um, creating a new document, we can go here and uh, change it. We also have our print options and exit, just like in Photoshop. Edit, of course, too. What we're used to seeing in an edit menu, our cut, our copy, our paste, our undo, redo, uh, so on and so forth. Now, for the most part, I'm going to be using keyboard commands um, for our copy, paste, cut, and things like that, as well as undo and redo. I suggest you, um, if you're not familiar already with your keyboard commands for these things, um, to sort of get familiar. They're a lot quicker and easier to use, and um, they give you the keyboard commands right here. And in most um, programs, these commands are going to be the same. So your paste, your undo, your copy, your cut. For most any program that you're going to use, they're going to be Control X, Control C, Control V, so on and so forth. Now here's a new item that we have in Illustrator that we don't have in Photoshop, and it's called Object. Now where Photoshop mainly deals, this would maybe be the selection menu in um, Photoshop. And where uh, Photoshop really deals a lot in altering and creating selections, um, Illustrator deals more in creating objects. And any object is a line, um, a shape, um, anything like that. And here we have lots of different options on how to um, manipulate um, and work with these objects. We're going to get a lot into a lot of these different ones and, and what they mean in our next few assignments. So again, I'm going to try to keep the introduction a little bit brief um, because we're going to be going over a lot of these things in the actual assignments. Here we have a full type menu, which of course is going to govern any sort of text or fonts that we use. And we have a, a lovely font selection just like in Photoshop here. Um, and we also, you can um, do the size here, but there's also options for that in the properties box, which we'll get to. Now we have a selection menu too, but again, we're not going to be selecting things like we are in Photoshop. There's no, you know, marching ants and things like that. Um, it's different because, of course, we're creating our own objects and not selecting areas of pixels. Um, but if, so as you can see, the select menu here is much, much shorter because it's a uh, uh, much less complicated than it is in Photoshop. Um, and it really just governs uh, what is being selected, you know, what objects are being selected on the board. Um, we have similar effects it, that we can apply to our objects, um, just like in Photoshop. So if we want to sort of stylize something or blur it or whatever else, we can do that here. Um, our view menu will give us lots of different options for what we can see. Um, and again, we're going to go over some of them. I don't personally use a lot of them. What I do like to use are the rulers. Um, <clears throat> they can help us, again, format things. And just like in Photoshop, we can drag and drop guidelines from our rulers to help our formatting and composition of our um, objects. And also, just like in Photoshop, if we go down, this is a long menu, we have grids. So this can be quite helpful, again, in our technical drawings uh, to make sure that everything is aligned properly if the guidelines just aren't cutting it for you. Now we can toggle the visibility of these guys on and off in our view menu as well. So if I don't want my grids, or my guides anymore, I can hide them as well. Okay? Now, there's a lot of other things in here too, including zoom and zoom out, but most of these things, again, can be found either in uh, the toolbox or there's keyboard shortcut commands for it, um, so on and so forth, especially for zoom in and zoom out. Um, I tend to always use the keyboard shortcut commands of control positive to zoom in and control negative to zoom out. They're just quicker and easier to use. Now if there's anything that's not popping up, you can find it in your window menu. And your min window menu, again, will have lots of different options for pop-up panes, um, depending on what you want to apply. 
Uh, some of them you'll use lots and lots. Some of them you might not ever use. Um, one important one that I'll go to right away is the layers. Now Illustrator has a layers function that's pretty much exactly the same as Photoshop. And we utilize it when we want to isolate different parts of our image. And of course we can layer them on top or underneath each other as we see fit, just like in Photoshop. And we have our layers shortcut right here, or we can find it in Windows. And right now we're just working on layer one, but just like in Photoshop, we can toggle the visibility of our layer on and off. Obviously it's not gonna make a difference now because there's nothing on it, <clears throat> except I guess it's going to delete the background for whatever reason, I don't know. We can also lock our layers, just like in Photoshop. If we don't want to um, change any part of that layer, we wanna ensure the isolation of a single layer, we can lock all other types of layers just by hitting this little box right here and locking it or unlocking it. We can create new layers down here with the create new layer. So you have another layer. Um, okay, so let's work on layer one and then maybe do something on layer two and we can look a little bit more on how our layers function, even though it's pretty much exactly the same as our um, Photoshop menu or Photoshop layers. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to use the pen tool, um, which really governs the whole bunch of tools right here. And the pen tool is by far the most utilized tool in Illustrator. And it's definitely going to be the tool that you use most in Illustrator for this class. So let's spend a good amount of time sort of getting in uh, used to how this pen tool works. Now we introduced the pen tool a little bit in Photoshop when we did those very complex path selections and it works the same way. So if you held off on utilizing the pen tool until now, now is the time to really go ahead and get used to using it. It takes a little while to, um, especially when you're curving the line, it takes a bit of time to sort of get used to how the pen tool works. So I really highly recommend that you just sort of play around with the pen tool first before starting on any assignment. So as you can see, when I bring the pen tool over, right now what we have is a like a little pencil and um, a circle with a slash through it. And that's telling me that, hey, 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 before you do anything, you're on a locked layer. So, you know, you're not allowed to do anything on a locked layer. So if I try to click or do anything, it's not gonna let me. Again, because the layer is locked. I have to jump up to an unlocked layer, either unlock layer one, or move to an unlocked layer to be able to begin. Now the icons that we see for the pen tool are the same in Photoshop. So um, if you remember from that lesson, our little star asterisk at the bottom right hand corner of our, our pen nib icon indicates that we are beginning a new line. So all I have to do to begin my line is click my mouse button once. Click, and then I uh, create what's called an anchor point. Okay, and we see that because it's <laughs> telling me right there that it's an anchor point. I'm gonna go ahead and we can see a little red line. Now the color of the line is going to depend on what your layer color is. See that color there? That says everything on layer um, two is gonna be highlighted in red. That's not its final color, that's just it's working color to let you know what layer, as a reminder to, uh, as to what layer you're working on. You can change that too in preferences if you'd like. Um, and we see layer one is blue. And when we work on layer one, these um, little highlighted colors will be blue. Okay, so I'm just gonna click along. I made my first anchor. And wherever I click again, I'm going to sort of drop down another anchor point and create a line in between these two. Now, let's continue going. And I'm just going to click, click, click. Now, as you can see, um, I'm getting another um, pen icon uh, in the bottom right-hand corner. And this one's like an upside down V. 
that represents the convert anchor point. Now, it's not going to make too much sense yet until we get to the curved line, so I'm going to hold off on it. But as we draw out, we can see a few other ones. So if I place the pen icon on the line, or path as they call it, um, I'm going to get a plus sign. And this means I'm going to be adding another anchor point on that line. So the line doesn't go back up there, I'm just adding another anchor point there. Now if I go back over it, I get a minus symbol, a, like a negative symbol. And this means it's going to delete that anchor point away. So if I click again, I delete the anchor point away. So let's continue on. And at no point do I need to close the shape, um, depending on what I'm doing. If I want to fill it with a color or a pattern, I will need to close the shape. And by that I mean ending up where I began. And you know you're closing the shape because we get this uh, new symbol, which is a little circle. And that means I'm closing the shape. And there, I no longer have the ability to continue the line because it's ended where it's began. However, I don't need to do that. If I want a line that is an open shape, I can simply just click off of the tool and uh, end my line. Okay? Now, let's look at this line a little bit more. Now, over here in these little boxes, we also have a property box, which is also this guy right here. We can toggle it on and off. And again, if you don't see any of these, you can find them in your windows and pull it up. So just to show you, here's layers. Down here, we have properties. And since it's open and visible, we get a nice little check to it. Uh, by it. So it's letting us know, um, you know, what's open and what's visible with those checks. Now, what I'm going to do is right now I have neither of these. I have two what's called objects. I have this one right here and this one here. And I have two arrows. Let's start with the black arrow because I want to show you how we can change properties of the existing shape or object. I'm going to select it. When we have it selected, we know it's selected because it's highlighted with the layer colors, and we also get that bounding box that again allows us to transform and rotate the object, just like in Photoshop. So the black arrow has a lot of the same properties as the move tool in Photoshop. So I can click on it and move it by clicking and dragging with the black arrow. I can also transform it. So if I do not hold shift, I can make it skinnier, or I can make it squatter, so on and so forth. However, if I want to preserve the proportions of the image and scale it up or down while constraining proportions, I have to hold shift. Now, this is the exact opposite uh, to how it is in Photoshop. In Photoshop, it auto-constrains proportions. So to get something skinnier or squatter, I have to hold shift. But in Illustrator, again, it's the opposite. It does not automatically constrain the proportions. So to constrain them, I have to hold shift. And then when I scale it, I get a proportionately larger or proportionately smaller image. Again, if I don't hold shift, I can make something that is um, free of the original proportion constraints. Now while we have this object highlighted, let's go over here to the properties box and look what's in it. Now here I can scale it numerically. So if I don't want to just click and drag bigger or smaller, I can type in specific values. So let's make it smaller. Um, in the X proportion, so I'm squishing it down. Now, I don't typically do this. This is nice, again, if you're working with specific measurements, but for the most part, um, I scale based on the eye and based on the grid and based on the ruler. But again, everybody works differently. So if you like to scale with numerical values and be very, very precise, 
go right ahead and use that transform box right here in the properties. Now what you will probably be using is right down here. Now there's a shortcut to this here. So this right here and this right here is the same thing. And they govern the color of what is the outline or stroke of the object and the fill of the object. So if I double click the fill or just click on the fill, come on now, I get a shortcut to a color picker. Okay, and I can use the swatches here to pick any sort of um, color that I want. Now, not only that, when we get onto it, we can also fill with gradients or patterns. But again, we'll get to that in later um, uh, episodes, episodes, lessons. <laughs> here we have a, a sort of shortcut, a smaller Adobe picker. But if you want that full scale, lovely Adobe picker, what you're gonna do is you're gonna come here and you're gonna double click on the full box. And then we're gonna get that Adobe Picker that we're used to seeing um, and that we got familiarized with in Photoshop. Remember we select the pure hue by sliding this bar on the rainbow bar, um, land on the pure hue that you like, and then pick the tonal range. Remember up here is blending incrementally more with white down through here is blending incrementally more with black and all through here are different combinations of gray and that pure hue of course the pure hue existing right here but let's do a nice sort of um, tone of that all right so now we have a nice blue weird shape and here is the same thing we can change the outline color right now the outline is black as you can see but if we'd like it to be, say, red, we can click here or we can double click on the rectangle. This sort of looks like a little window or picture frame right here. And we get the full, again, Adobe color picker, picker window here. Oops. I don't know how I inadvertently changed the fill as well. But let's just change that back so we can see. So now let me um, deselect it and zoom in and you can see that we have a red outline uh, shape with a blue fill. Now let's go back. Um, so we no longer have the properties for the shape because I'm not selecting the shape. These properties are now just for the uh, document on a whole. So let's click back on here, watch it change. And in the stroke here, we can adjust how thick that outline is. So we can make it thick, or we can make it thin, however we please. We can also adjust the opacity of the image. So right now it's at full opacity. Oh, sorry, let's click back there. Um, but if I want the image or object to be see-through, um, I can go ahead and lower the opacity. Now this is gonna make it lighter because it's allowing that white background to show through. And what I can do, too, is show you that it will allow oops, this to uh, show through. Now, what's happening right now, this is another thing about objects, is objects will layer on a single layer in chronological order. That means I made this one first, so it is beneath this object. Okay? So if I put it on top, it will block out this object. Now, if I don't want this, if I want this shape to be on top, what I can do is I can select either object, it doesn't really matter, right click and go to arrange. Now, I want, if I want this forward, I can bring it forward to just do one step above, or if I want it above many different elements that it may be sitting behind, I can bring it to the front. Now we can see here, it is on top. It's still see-through because the opacity has been lowered, but let's go ahead and raise that opacity back to 100, and it's layering nicely on top of that second object that I created. <laughs> My dog is dreaming. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, okay. 
So another thing we can do with our black arrow is we can rotate. And if we go up here on the bounding box, we get a sort of curved double-headed arrow. And I can click, click and drag to rotate the object around. Now, there's another neat thing that we're, uh, we can do with stroke, and I'll definitely get back onto this when we get into our flats. Um, and it's a little bit more of an obscure option, but if we go down here to the, uh, oops, sorry. If we double click on stroke, oh, or just click on stroke, <laughs> we get more options for the stroke. We have our same weight, but we can also adjust what the corners look like. So if we don't want round corners, we can soften them. And we can also dash the line. Now, this is very important for us when we create flats because this is a fantastic way to create top stitching details on hems or patch pockets or wherever we might need um, top stitching. And we can adjust how that um, dash looks like right here. So if there's an automatic default to put it at 12 points. And if we just put one value in, it goes one point solid, one point gap. One point solid, or 12 point solid, 12 point gap. And it just repeats so on and so forth. But we can also change it up. So if I want a smaller gap, I can just type it in here. So now I have a smaller gap. And uh, it gives us actually a lot of options. So I can really make, you know, I've never used this. It's usually for us, it's just top stitching is completely even. But for every reason, if you do want to do this, that's how you would do it. Um, I'm going to switch over to this guy to show you a couple more of these options. Um, down here, if you want to point out specific details, we have arrowhead options. So you can create a line with an arrowhead. So if you meant to point out a specific detail, um, it's very easy to do it like that. And we also have um, different I would say sort of like brush strokes. We have our own brush strokes here, but um, uh, line quality options, um, which again will be nice to use. Let's uh, up the weight on this so you can see it a little bit better. So we have the, these different line quality options, which can give a really nice sort of artistic feeling to some of our flats. And we'll show you uh, where they're best utilized when we do get to that. Okay, so now that we have sort of our basic shapes, I'm gonna go ahead and delete these guys, and let's go back to our pen tool and its functions. So again, these are all, I'm really just, again, going over the pen tool and going over, you know, what we're creating. And really, like 90% of what you're gonna be creating in Illustrator are those types of lines and objects. And just by amalgamating these simple lines and objects, we're going to create very complex imagery. Now, one thing as we sort of go back to our pen tool, um, we learned how to create a line and that's fantastic. Um, but what if we want to create a curved line? These were only options for creating um, hard corners um, and sort of, you know, straight line options in between our anchor points. Of that. So what if we want to create a curved point or a curved line? So what I'm going to do to do that is I'm going to start off the exact same way just by clicking and placing an anchor point. Okay. Now, what's nice about Illustrator is it's going to let us know exactly what the line is going to look like by this sort of little preview red line. Okay. Now to create a curved line, What's going to happen is I'm going to click, but I'm going to hold my mouse button down. So I'm clicking and holding that mouse button down. Now while holding that mouse button, I'm going to start dragging the mouse away from my anchor point. And as you can see, depending on how far away from that anchor point I travel and in what direction, I'm going to create a curve. Now, what I'm also creating are these two lines that are um, sort of springing out from the anchor point, and they're called our handlebars. Now, if you look at the handlebar that my mouse isn't holding, the one closer to the line that I'm creating, 
just imagine like that little ball as like a magnet to that line and it's sort of stretching that line and the farther away it goes the more it's going to be pulling that line so let's make a curve like so okay whenever that preview line is the curve that you would like just release the mouse button and it will drop down your line now our handlebars are not only governing, um, cur governing what curve is taking place here, but it's also going to create a subsequent um, curve between my previous anchor point and my next anchor point. And you can see that. I'm not doing anything. I'm not even touching the mouse right now, but already my preview line is curved, and it's curved in a counterbalance to my previous curve. So if I don't do anything and just click, I'm going to get that counterbalance curve, okay? But let's say I don't want a counterbalance curve. What if I want a straight line to come here? Well, that's where our convert anchor point tool is going to come into use. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hover over that previously made anchor point and click and I know I'm up with the right tool because again, I get that upside down V shape. So I click the handlebar that's going to um, govern my subsequent curve goes away and my preview line is now straight. So I'd go ahead and really sort of practice making those curves. What I like to do or, or to tell students is to just practice maybe making their name in cursive. I don't know if you guys still learned cursive, but if you did, or you don't have to. out your name. It's a nice way to just sort of practice. So if you want to end and just click off with your black arrow and then click back on to start a new line. I'm just going to write my name, but I'm not going to bother. This is going to be a little exercise for you. And it's a nice way to just sort of get a little bit more familiar with um, how to utilize the pen tool. Okay. Now let's create another little just quick object. Boop, boop, boop. Doesn't matter what it is. And let's go up here. So we've talked a little bit about the black arrow. Um, but there's also another tool that's used heavily in tandem with the pen tool, and that's the white arrow. So they're very similar, um, but whereas the black arrow really uh, is involved with changing your object on a whole, so moving the entire object, or scaling or transforming the entire object, or, cur or rotating the entire object, what we have in the white arrow is um, the ability to manipulate and change specific aspects of your object. So, whereas this is called just the selection tool, this is called the direct selection tool. I'll re be referring it to uh, them as the white arrow and black arrow. I feel it's a bit more direct. Just remember that the direct means direct into certain areas. So let's take a look at what the white arrow does. What I'm gonna do is before I do anything, I'm gonna go ahead and with the white arrow click off and then back on again. Now if you notice a difference, the difference is that now these little anchor points are hollow or white in the middle. Whereas if I select it with the black arrow, well, if we have it, the points a lot of times are um, solid, okay? You'll know that you'll be able to directly select or, you know, pick out certain elements when they're hollow like that. And that only happens when you select it with the white arrow, okay? 
So with the white arrow, I can go in and pick up particular anchor points and click and drag to move them, okay? So if I want to change a specific anchor point where it's located, I can do that with the white arrow. I can also grab line segments. So say if I want this whole line here to just be out a little bit more, I can grab it, click, drag, uh, click it to grab it and then drag it um, to the place where I want it to be. I can also click curved lines and do the same thing. Now, as you can see, I also have handlebars peeking out um, here. So if I want to adjust a curve, I can also do that with the white arrow. I can just grab the handlebars and start to um, individually go ahead and change the curves that I've made, okay? So any sort of specific or individual um, part that you want to change about your line or your object, you can do that with your white arrow. Okay, um, that honestly is about 90% of the stuff that we're going to be using for Illustrator. <laughs> I'm gonna quickly go through some of the other tools. I'm not gonna go through all of the tools. Some of the tools we're just not gonna be utilizing. Um, they're not going to be super relevant in the context uh, in which we are going to be using Illustrator. Um, and a lot of them, again, are going to be very similar to what we saw in Photoshop. Now this down here is a curvature tool. If you're having trouble with the curve, um, you know, this can help to make curves. As you can see, it's a little wiggly. I don't often use it because I've never found that the pen tool to be lacking in any way for making curves. Um, uh, but again, if you want to practice using the curvature tool, if you like to use it a little bit better, go and be my guest. I'm not going to be using it in any of the demos. I'm going to just be curving the pen tool the old fashioned way. Uh, down here are our shape tools, which are the same as we saw in um, Photoshop. So if you don't want to draw out your shape because it is a very basic shape, we can do that with our shape tools right here. So here we have the rectangle. So we can just click and drag to create a rectangle. It's an object like anything else. So we can govern the colors of it um, just like we can any other object like I, sh I showed you before with um, our objects created by the pen tool. So we have our fill color here and our stroke color here. Um, if you want to swap them, that's, that's what that is. You can just swap your colors right there. Maybe you place the colors accidentally in the wrong options, so you can just swap them back and forth. If we click and hold, we get the drop-down menu for our shapes, and we get a few other shape options, like an ellipse. Now, if we want any standard uh, shape, if we're, or if we want any um, regular shape, uh, like a not a rectangle but a perfect square or not an ellipse but a perfect circle hold down shift and we'll get a perfect element okay now there's one other option for fill um, so I have this obviously as the green fill we can see there but if I don't want any fill if I just want a stroke or if I want the stroke to be invisible um, we have the option of creating an invisible fill or an invisible stroke. So if I click this, the red slash, it's a nil fill and it will be invisible. So I can see all elements beneath it. It was applied to my fill because that is the one that's on top right now. If I click on my stroke, that will pop on top of my fill and now I can apply the invisible fill to the stroke. Now it's completely invisible, I can't see it, just the um, uh, highlighted uh, layer colors are able to be seen. Let's put something back in there because we want to be able to see it. And we have a couple other tools, polygon will give us a little polygon shape, la la la. We also have a star. La. I'm gonna start working on a new layer just so I can show you some of the layer functions. Now, um, we can always grab something. Oops. 
and paste it onto another layer. Now you can see the highlight is green, no longer red, because it's on a new layer. So this would be red highlighted because we know it's on layer two, and this is green highlighted because again we know it's on layer three. Now just like in Photoshop, we can click and drag our layers depending on how we want things to be layered um, on top of each other. Now, um, I showed you before the arrange. The arrange function only works for objects on the same layer. So if I were to do the same thing here to this star and bring it to the front, it's not going to do anything because it will only bring it to the front of other objects on layer three. And since the entirety of layer three is below layer two, where all my other elements are, it's not going to show you any. It's not going to go on top of these um, other elements. Okay. Our brush tool um, works um, just the same way as uh, in Photoshop. And of course we have um, a lot of the same options. We have brush options here. We can do some, some textured brushes or whatever else. Um, we're, I don't typically use the brush. Um, if you want to make some fun graphic with it, you can um, make a little bit of extra uh, whatever you can. Um, I don't tend to use the brush tool in Illustrator um, because you can apply all the same brush textures to your line created by the pen tool. And I just, the brush tool is a free form. It's if you click and drag to create the graphics. And I just find a lot more control um, with the pen tool than doing it free form. Um, if you have a stylus and prefer using the brush tool um, and it is okay and it works for you, that's great. I'm going to recommend against it, um, especially when we get to technical drawings because absolutely perfect line quality is a must when we get to technical drawings. Um, uh, the brush tool is really utilized for more sort of, you know, just il stylistic illustrations, um, artwork that aren't, that is not technical. Um, uh, so we're not going to be using it. Go ahead and let's Remember, we can toggle the visibility of different layers here, just so you can see that. And let's maybe create a new layer, to create a little bit more room. And um, the next up on our list is our type tool. And the type tool is pretty much the same as our Photoshop. So we can click for it, um, a text box that we can adjust with our black arrow which is really good for just titles or standalone text because we can rotate it, we can um, uh, size it specifically. But if we're going to do a bulk of text, like a paragraph or something else, and we have a specific area in which we want it, it's good to click and drag. And what we're going to click and drag is a type as a text box. And that text box is going to go ahead and give you um, a constrained area in which you um, can put your text like right here. Of course, we can still move our text with the black arrow. And if we want to make our text box bigger or smaller, now remember when I size this guy with the black arrow, it just became, the text itself became bigger. But when I resize this box, it's going to adjust how the text is displayed. It's not gonna change the size of the font. Now, if I go back here and highlight my text, I can come to my properties and apply different things to my text. So if I go down here to character, I'm gonna jump down here. Now we can also, if you wanna do bold or anything, you can just adjust the stroke value and see how it's becoming more bold it, when I create a bit, um, larger um, stroke. Now, I, I currently have blue as applied for my stroke, and I'll show you what that looks like. It creates a nice blue stroke, um, and if it's thick enough, it creates an entirely blue font. Um, of course, you can make that any color you so see fit. We can also adjust the opacity of our um, text. 
So again, if I want a, something that's see-through, I want to be able to see through the text, which I don't recommend because it makes your text hard to read. But again, if something you want to do, go right ahead. <laughs> Let's go back up. Now down here, if we scroll down, we're going to get a lot more options for um, our uh, font down here. We can adjust the size of the font right here. We can choose a different font. So I can scroll through. Let's find something fun. Nice little brush script. This will adjust the spacing in between the lines. So right now I have 18 points in between these lines. So if I want them closer together, I can decrease or I can increase if I want um, a larger spacing. Now down here um, should be very familiar to you if you've ever used something like Word. And these are alignment presets. Right now we have a basic align left which is aligning all of my font to the left of my text box. We have a center alignment, as well as a right alignment, as well as a justify. Now these guys will justify and then really has to do with this last line right here. Um, so everything else is justified, but the last line has been centered. Everything is justified, but the last line is aligned right. Same here, aligned left. Uh, this is a complete justification. Um, so on and so forth. We also have a few other paragraphed options where you can really heavily edit all the sorts of indentations, um, whether or not your text is being hyphenated or not, um, which it will do automatically if you do not unclick that um, to fit the text box space. Okay, so there's our text. As you can see, there's a lot more options than in Photoshop, which is typically why I like to deal with text formatting in Illustrator as opposed to Photoshop. Can you do it in Photoshop? Yes. Is it a little bit more frustrating because you don't have as many options? Yeah. Um, but again, it's going to be up to you. And it's always typically easy to sort of um, uh, copy and paste things from one program into another. So if I have an image, I can either just save it as a JPEG and open it up in Illustrator, or just if I don't even want to save the whole file, I can just copy what I want from that file and paste it directly into um, Illustrator. We're not going to be doing any cross-program assignments that require you to utilize both Photoshop and Illustrator. But again, I do it constantly um, when working on my own things professionally. So if you want to try to utilize that, um, I think it's very helpful. Another couple things I want to show just in the type tool. So if we hold down, we get another menu. We have a vertical type tool, which is the same um, as in Photoshop. And we also have one more option. So say I want a very specific sort of type direction. I'm creating a mood board that has, uh, I want sort of text to sort of wind through it. We have another option here called type on a path tool. So I've created this path here, right? So I'm going to select the type on a path tool and I'm going to come here at the beginning of this path um, till it says anchor so I know I'm on it and then I'm going to go ahead and click on it. And as you can see now, it's creating the text in the same um, sort of curvature as the path that I, I created. Pretty neat, huh? That's something we don't have in Photoshop. Okay, I'm going to jump down through all these tools, we're not really going to be using any of these tools. Um, the gradient tool is going to be utilized later on. It is used on objects with a fill to create a gradient. So a gradient is a blending of um, uh, colors. So right here we have just sort of the gradient preview. As you can see, it's darker here, it's lighter here. I can adjust sort of how the gradient blends in with one another. Um, if I double click, I can go ahead and put colors in. Right? I can put colors in. 
I don't know why the palette didn't want to be used. So if I wanted n if this not to be black and white, if I wanted it blue and red, um, actually blue and red is, well, they're pretty good because you get a purple in the middle. Um, it's good to create gradients or ombre effects as we tend to call them a lot of times in design and fashion um, between colors that are contiguous on the color circle because they blend better. So instead of um, blue and red, I really should be picking like a red and orange. Uh, and then blend to yellow, so on and so forth. It will give you a nicer, richer blend, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and we're gonna utilize that a little bit more when we get to sort of colors. And um, it's not often used, but ombre effects are utilized in fashion with dip dyes and um, with knit patterns and in lots of different times. And so you might wanna use it in some of your, your images. Um, so we have this really lovely ability to create these gradient tools. And I'm going to get into more, uh, more of that later on when we get into coloring our flats. Um, but for right now, I'm just, that's what it's for. Right here, we have the eyedropper tool, which works exactly like the eyedropper tool in Photoshop. Um, if we have a, let's go back to layer two, got a few objects. If I have an, an object selected, I can utilize the um, eyedropper tool on another object to create the same fill and stroke as whatever I click on with the eyedropper tool. Okay, and if you have a, so you can open images. So I wanna be clear too, so just because Illustrator is not typically used for photo editing does not mean I can't put images in Illustrator and utilize them. You can open up um, uh, images in Illustrator if you want them in your pamphlet or line sheet or whatever else. Uh, you just can't edit the image the same way you can in Photoshop. Um, so say I have you know, uh, some sort of picture graphic, I can open it or copy and paste it into here and utilize it within my image. Um, I can't select pickles, pixels from it. I can't change you know, the color saturation or the um, uh, contrast or levels or, or all that different stuff. There's, I can't correct it with a, with a healing brush or, or any of that stuff I can do in Photoshop. But I can, you know, once the image is complete, if I do need to do those things or if I have a, 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 an image that doesn't need any editing, I can very easily either open up a JPEG in um, uh, Illustrator or copy and paste uh, an image into Illustrator and utilize it within, you know, um, uh, a larger graphic. We're not going to use any of these, so don't even worry about it. I'm going to skip over them. Uh, the hand tool is exactly the same as Photoshop, and basically we use it if we are super zoomed in and we want to move around uh, the canvas. We just click and drag with that hand tool. Okay, guys. I think for the most part, that's going to be um, your quick intro to um, Illustrator. Again, it's, it's really not that much stuff. Um, uh, so get used to using the pen tool, that's all I can say. And again, a lot of this stuff we're gonna get sort of slowly used to and review and, and, and build up our skills um, in the subsequent assignments. So I'll see you in our next assignment, uh, our next lesson, which we're gonna do our first Illustrator assignment, which is going to be a follow along colored flat. So I'll see you then.